Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for worship here today at River of Life. A uh, couple of announcements before we begin. If you haven't been part of one of our life groups yet, it's our chance to connect with each other even though we're apart in this time. Uh, we would encourage you to do that. We have groups on Sunday night, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night. And even if you just stop in and say hi for a few minutes, guys, it, we're, we're, we're all missing that connection that we have with each other. So that, that's a way we can do that. And I, I just really encourage you to do that if you haven't done so yet. Also, uh, if you're interested in volunteering in this time of stress, trying to help out folks that are in need, the Regional Food Bank is in desperate need of volunteers to serve uh, by uh, delivering food to people who need it, who can't get out and, and do that. You've received an email from Sean if you're on our email list. If you're not, uh, please try to let us know so that we can get you on that list. But uh, that's a big need that we as a church can fulfill. Uh, they've, they've asked specifically for volunteers to do that. So if you're looking for something to do in the time where you're kind of sitting around uh, doing, doing not much for we're in, that's a great opportunity to show the love of Christ. So as we move into our time of uh, worship today, I just pray, it's my prayer, that God will touch your heart and that he will move you to be more like him. Thanks, guys. morning River I'm so glad that uh, that you've tuned in this morning as we've worshiped God and uh, opened his word and uh, are, are opening his word to let him speak into our souls and speak in our hearts and uh, so this morning I want to share with you guys about uh, tr trying to make sense out of suffering how do we how do we make sense out of the the difficulties and challenges that we go through in, in life you know, there's something that separates us from the animal kingdom, from the, the dogs and the sheep and the cows. They don't sit back and try to reason and analyze their existence and their life. They react and they respond to the stimuli and what's going on in their environment for their own survival and for the, you know, the carrying forward of their, of their species. But we as people are different. We're made in the image of God. And because of it, we reflect and we find value and we analyze. And one of the things that we are challenged with as people is this topic of suffering. Why, why do I have to go through this? What is going on? What, what, this is not what I expected. This is not what I wanted. This is not what I signed up for. And, and this morning, as we open God's word, we're going to see that Paul shares with us some significant things that you, we need to be aware of because Suffering is not just a common experience in all of humanity, but it's especially a common experience for those who follow Jesus Christ. That Jesus told us that we should expect persecution as we follow our Lord, that, that the world persecuted him. And because we follow him, him and believe as he taught us that we should expect it as well. So take your Bible, if you would, and look with me in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. The Bible says this, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also 
or for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to those who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day, on that day to be glorified in his saints, to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Five things I want to share with you this morning about what it means uh, for us to suffer. Why would God have us go through suffering? For us as followers of Jesus, it's not a surprise to us. We, we should expect that. And it, and it honestly makes sense is, is what Paul shares with us here in this passage. For those who don't know Jesus, for those who've never surrendered their life to him, suffering doesn't make sense in their life. Why should they have to put up with and go through the pains or the challenges of life or various other things? But for us, it does. First thing I want you to recognize this morning is that suffering reveals, su suffering reveals our citizenship. Have you ever watched some of those uh, YouTube videos? Uh, there's all, obviously a bazillion of them out there and all kinds of videos now today on whether it's TikTok or whatever else is going on, the latest social media. But uh, I've watched, I've enjoyed watching uh, some of the videos where uh, somebody will take an old tool, like an old hand tool, like an old metal vise or, you know, uh, that you would mount on a, on a workbench and that can hold your work or an old, you know, me metal tool that's used, whether it's an old uh, plane or something like that that's been neglected and forgotten, it's rusted and it's got, you know, it's oxidized, there's paint on it and there's just gunk and just, you know, almost thrown away and ignored in life. And I watch those guys as they will carefully, those craftsmen will take that, that instrument, that tool, and they will take apart the old screws and sometimes they have to heat it up and, and work and get it down to the bare bones, if you will. And, and then they will begin to, to, to take away all of the corrosion and all of the, the years of neglect and they'll they'll put it almost in like in a chemical bath to kind of clean it up and to get rid of some of the the, the 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 gunk and stuff that's on it and then they'll go to sanding it and grinding it and filing it and buffing it and and when they're done the thing looks amazing it looks just absolutely brand new what God is doing in our life through suffering is he is revealing that which we really are meant to be. He's, he's removing the, the outside veneer, the outside corrosion and gunk that life has allowed into our souls. The, our sin nature has allowed for us to go through and has, has added those layers to us, if you will. And he's, he, the suffering removes that. And so it reveals our citizenship. That's the first thing that it reveals is God removes that through the suffering, through the, the bathing and through the grinding and through the sanding and all of the torture that we go through. That process for that tool is not an enjoyable process. It's a painful process, if you will. And much like that, it impacts our soul the exact same way. And Paul says this. He says, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Paul says this is, this is evidence that you are a part of the kingdom of God, that you are suffering for this. This is the, this is the reason why you're going through this. Now, what exactly is the evidence, the, the evidence of our testimony? Well, he tells us this. If you look in the verse just before it, I mentioned it last week. But he tells us in verse 4 that he's boasting about their steadfastness and their faith and all their persecutions and the afflictions that they are enduring. See, when we go through afflictions and we go through persecutions and those trials for our faith, and when we go through just the difficult things in life, and we endure those, and we endure those faithfully where we honor the Lord Jesus and we don't throw in the towel. We don't complain and fight against God and we don't curse God and we don't, we don't sit back and say, this isn't fair and this isn't right. Why do I have to go through that? And when we, 
when we endure those faithfully trusting and looking to our God, no matter how difficult those are, no matter how awful that it is, what Paul is telling us is that, that those, that suffering, that trial reveals our citizenship. It reveals that we are worthy of the kingdom of God. Since the Civil War, there have been about 2,000 uh, medals of honor that have been uh, given to soldiers and given to Marines and airmen that, uh, that have uh, either given their life or who have stepped in in a time going above and beyond the call of duty with such tremendous valor that they, they risked their life and their limb and some of them lost their lives as an act of bravery, as an act of... of uh, of, of valor uh, in the face of the enemy. And the, reading some of the stories that I read this week were just, just staggering what these, these individuals have done. Whenever there is a, a person that is being considered for the Medal of Honor, there is a, an investigation, if you will. There is a, a research into that history, into that person's life, and into the facts of the, the, the series of events of that particular day and that particular moment in the war or the conflict. What Paul is telling us is that the, the sufferings that we go through, as those trials and as that, that conflict in which we live, even under persecution, that they reveal, those facts reveal that you and I live worthy of the citizenship of the kingdom of our God. It reveals to the world around us and it reveals to us even the very nature of our life that we have been changed by Jesus Christ, that, that our life is with him and as we trust and as we live for him in the middle of all of the difficulties in spite of all of those things, that we live for him, that we don't, we don't throw in the towel, we don't say, oh, that's okay, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm good, I don't, I don't believe that way anymore that it reveals our true nature. You know, a soldier, when they're being trained for, for combat and they go through basic training and all the other additional extensive training, there's no training that can really fully reproduce reality, what it really is like to face the enemy. And no soldier really knows what they're going to do in that moment of truth and that in that, that hour when they must face the enemy and must face those difficult challenges. What Paul is telling to us is that we should make what makes sense of our suffering is that God is revealing to us what we're really made of, that our Christian faith stands true, that it endures, and that part of what God is doing in the middle of our suffering is revealing to us the very core nature, just the, who we are as, as followers of our Lord Jesus Christ and that we are a part of his kingdom of God. So don't be surprised when suffering happens because God actually means it and he uses it to, to show us and to reveal just the very nature and character of our faith as we follow him. Second thing I want you to recognize that God has for us is, is what those, that suffering and that persecution and that affliction, the reason that comes into our life is it reveals the justice of our God. It reveals God's justice. In verse 4, Paul talked about two different kinds of suffering. He talks about afflictions, which are your garden variety, generic, run-of-the-mill difficulty things of life. The, the difficult challenges, whether they be health or financial or just, just making things work. Divorce can be in that world. Losing your job can be in that world. Being, uh, dealing tremendous pain uh, and, and pain management and, and health issues can be a part of that world. Conflict, difficulties at work, those kinds of things. But the Bible tells us there's another layer of suffering, and Paul describes it as persecution. It's the when because of our faith that we come under attack from others. With it, because we believe in our Lord Jesus and because of that belief that we follow him, that means that we live a certain way. It means that we believe certain things. And when those around us who do not follow our Lord Jesus see those things, they're either offended by that or they feel that somehow that they're under attack by those things and that and, and, and it threatens even their, their ego or it threatens just their you know, their sense of self-identity. 
And consequently, there is a, a persecution that can ensue between those who follow the Lord Jesus and those who do not. Those things heat up. In fact, recently, it's showing up even uh, here in, in our state of New York. Uh, you may have heard that Samaritan's Purse, uh, a, a, a relief ministry, a Christian relief organization that works globally. In fact, we participate in their Operation Christmas Child every year and, and receiving uh, Christmas boxes so they can go to, to kids around the world. What you may not know is they send teams around the world when there's a pandemic or a disaster. Uh, and medical teams where there are qualified doctors and nurses and personnel to go and minister in those times of crises. Well, they, they worked in partnership or are working in partnership with a hospital in New York City. And they've set up a, a mobile hospital, uh, 64 beds. In fact, I read recently, I think they've treated 140 patients where uh, they're on their own nickel, on their, their own money, coming to provide relief for the, the COVID-19 patients that are not the critical care needing ICU care, but they are taking care of them uh, right near the hospital in conjunction with them, providing them for, for that wonderful care to give relief, brought in their own ventilators and all of that. Well, there was an individual because uh, Samaritan's Purse is a Christian organization that believes the Bible and holds to that with a definition of, of sexuality and marriage of a, a one man and one woman for a lifetime and a covenant of marriage. And, and one person came claiming discrimination against them, even though as a ministry organization, they would give care equally to anyone that comes into their midst. Because God commands us to, that we're to, to show that love and that respect and to, to give of their need. But yet they're accused of persecution. Sometimes you and I face persecution because they're accused of discrimination, which is a form of persecution. Sometimes you and I face mild levels of persecution because people don't understand us and they think we're saying one thing when we're not and they, they feel offended and they feel threatened and their ego is attacked. That's nothing new. The Bible tells us in the book of Esther that there was a man by the name of Haman and he had risen to the number two in the land. But there was another man by the name of Mordecai who was a Jew and Haman had just a little bit of an ego issue and he wanted all people besides the king to bow down to him and to honor him. And, and they all did because they knew the authority and influence he had in the politics in the kingdom of the land. But, but Mordecai didn't. Because he honored God and he only bowed before God and he served his king. And the Bible says that Haman was offended and he was, had such ego that he, he set forward the plans in motion to build a gallows to have, to have Mordecai executed and hung on those gallows. In fact, he wanted all the Jews to be exterminated and killed in the land. But God had a different plan. And God protected Mordecai. And, and ultimately, the plan was discovered. And Haman was ultimately hung on his own gallows. Daniel was a man who honored God in his kingdom. And his, uh, the other leaders were jealous of Daniel. It's not because they didn't believe in what he believed. They didn't. But they were jealous in their own egos and their own self-worth uh, self got in the way. And they complained to the king and they managed to make it a rule that Daniel had to be thrown into the lion's den, a place where he would surely be ripped limb from limb. But God supernaturally protected him. And those very leaders, when Daniel was protected, the king said, what are you doing? And rescued Daniel out of that and threw them in. And they faced all of them and their families, the Bible tells us the story that they died uh, being ripped apart. See, that's what this passage is telling us about, is that when you and I go through persecution, and when we live a life willing to walk in a way that honors the Lord Jesus in suffering, that that persecution will ultimately reveal the righteous justice of a holy God. The Bible from the beginning all the way to the end tells us that God is just. Life is not fair. It's really not fair for anybody. But God makes life just and equitable. Listen to these words. These are, these are challenging words. Paul says to us as Christians who are suffering persecution and affliction, he tells us, he says, look, God considers it just, in verse 6, to repay with affliction those who afflict you, those who are persecuting you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. 
when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Notice verse 7. He says that God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted. You see, as Christians, we say, why, why should I be going through this suffering? We're tempted to say, does God care anymore? Does God not love me? What, why am I going through this? We want to make sense of the world around us. It's who we are as humans, made in the image of God, trying to make sense of the world. And what Paul is telling us, there's a reason. And we should not sit back and say, what's the use of suffering and going through this persecution when they get off scot-free and I'm the one who's being troubled and challenged and what God is trying to encourage us is it is worth it. It is worth it to hold to our Lord Jesus and our faith, to endure that persecution because God puts a limit that one day our Lord Jesus will come and will say, that is enough. One day that in the middle of your affliction and per persecution, God will say, that is enough, and he will provide relief. You know, I like to shoot bows, and it's something that I enjoy to do, and I like, to, I like the, the discipline and the archery, the physical, the, the skill, all that's behind it. Whenever an archer draws, draws back the bow, those, and I'm thinking of compound bow now, those strings and the cables come under tremendous tension, and they, they draw back and have such incredible kinetic energy that is, or energy that is stored. And then when the archer releases that string, and it, and it shoves that arrow forward. All of that energy goes from the strings into that arrow and sends it out forward. That arrow experiences relief. It experiences a, a release of that tension and that pressure. That's what Paul is telling us. He's telling us to be encouraged that in the middle of our suffering, in the middle of persecution, that there's a limit, that God himself will make sure to provide a relief to us. And that relief, ultimately, it, it happens, I believe, situationally in moments in our lives. We think, I can't endure this anymore, this suffering and this difficulty. And God says, I know, I'm only going to let it go so far. And he cares for us and he helps us in those moments. But ultimately, what we just read in 2 Thessalonians is when our Lord Jesus comes, that it's going to mean two different things. For those who know our Lord Jesus and who are followers of him, that it will be a tremendous blessing and a tremendous relief from all of that hardship and from all of that suffering. But to those who do not know God and to, who do not obey the gospel, it will come to them that they will re receive the righteous, just retribution, punishment of a God in heaven that says, because of your disobedience, now you must endure the punishment and the suffering and the agony of your life. For us as Christians, followers of our Lord, that should give us a hope and encouragement that God is still in control in the middle of all of our suffering and that God is using our suffering to demonstrate his righteous justice in the world around us. It makes sense of it for us. It helps us to understand the bigger picture. For some of you this morning who don't, do not know the Lord Jesus, I want you to notice before I move on and share the next three things about what our suffering reveals. I want you to notice that this, this justice that God brings is not revenge. Verse 8, the word is vengeance. God doesn't get revenge because God's not ultimately out for his own personal gain. That's what revenge is all about. God is for justice and it comes in the form of, of divine retribution, a, a, a vengeance that comes to those who've disobeyed God. But in this case, it comes to those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Notice he doesn't say he's coming to bring his punishment to all the Hitlers of the world and all the, the rapists in the world or all the really bad people. He's coming to bring retribution to those who don't know God and who don't obey the gospel. That's a much more subdued kind of thing. That's more than just those who are out and out, out to get Christians. 
My family and I a few years ago went to the National Zoo in uh, Washington, D.C. For us, it was a highlight. We must not be too educationally oriented because we kind of like that better than most of the Smithsonian things, but don't tell the, the curators of the museums there. But one exhibit in particular in the zoo was, was just fantastic to us. It was the, the otters. I don't know if you've seen otters in life or in videos or anything, but they are just some of the coolest, absolute most amazing animals on this planet. Just to us as people, they look fun loving and just they, they seem playful and so energetic. And, and we went and, and the exhibit allowed us to see the otters, you know, up, up top, above, um, see them in the water and look down in and, and see what they're doing. But then we could walk around down underneath and we could see the glass display that uh, that we could look through and see the otters just swimming around. And they were so curious about us as people. In fact, we had a little pebble with us, a little rock, and we'd throw in the air. And they would, on the other side of the glass in the water, they would try to chase it. And they were just so acrobatic in the, in the water. You know, I met the otters that day. But I really don't know the otters or know those otters. I could see them. But I didn't touch them. I couldn't put my hands into their webbed feet to see what that feels like. I don't know what the, their, their nails on their claws feel like. They, they eat fish, and, and that's why they can swim so well. I didn't feel how sharp their teeth were. I couldn't put my, my face to their fur to just to feel that and smell what they smelled like. I really didn't know them. I, don't, I, I didn't spend so much time with them. I know their quirks or their individual habits or where they slept and what they like to do. Like I'm sure their keepers know them. See, that's the way it is with most people. They look at God through a glass, through a window, and they believe in God, and they see that God's done some cool stuff, but they really don't know God. They haven't really spent the time with God, and they haven't really entered into a bona fide relationship with God, and there's a barrier between them and God. The Bible calls that sin. You see, our sin has separated us from God so that we cannot know God the way we ought to and the way we want to. We think we do, but actually we just know about God. And we believe in God, but we really don't have a relationship with Him. And we really are not obeying, second part of what Paul tells us, we're really not obeying the gospel. You see, the gospel tells us that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, overcoming our sins and gave us victory. And that our resting our entire hope and our future and our salvation and our faith on that event alone is what saves us from our sins. Until we make that step, that type of surrendered commitment in our heart, there's a wall between us and God. And we're on the outside looking in. And what Paul is telling us should be sobering to us this morning, that everyone, everyone who doesn't really know God, who's still separated from their sins and has not obeyed that gospel, the, the gospel that says that, that there is hope and salvation through Jesus, and you would better surrender to that. Everyone who hasn't done that, one day the Lord Jesus will return and there will be no second chances. There will be no second opportunities. There will be no mulligans in golf. There will be no do-overs, no restarting the video game, no extra life that you can, you know, get back and start over again. And it will be a life of eternal separation from God away from the presence, in verse 9, of the Lord. Think about that for a minute. How much have we struggled over these last... I don't know, month, we're going on a couple of months now with all of this. How much have we struggle being separated from the things we like to do, from our sports and our activities and our events? How much have we struggle being separated from people that we love? And the Bible tells us the day is coming when people who do not know the Lord Jesus will be separated from eternity, from the presence and the power and the grace of God. You see, nobody today, I don't care if you believe in God or not, nobody today lives outside of the presence of God. Everybody experiences the, the blessing of the sun coming up and the rain coming down and of God working and overseeing in a world. People often complain, well, if there's 
if God's a good God, why is such bad things happening in the world? They don't stop and ask the opposite. Well, wow, there's a lot of good in the world, so maybe God does have some good things about them. And the Bible tells us that eternity for those individuals will be removed from that in isolation and darkness and loneliness and the pain and the suffering for an eternity because they didn't receive the blessed gospel hope that God offers to them. So in the middle of us as Christians that we should be encouraged that there's a reason for our suffering. I also want to point out there's a reason for us as Christians to make sure we hold that hope and that life to those around us because eternity is for forever. And God is giving people an opportunity right now to experience that life. And if you've not experienced that, I urge you, stop the video, say, God, get on your knees if you need or whatever. If you're driving, listening, just say, God, I know I've sinned. I don't want to be stuck with Jesus coming. I don't want that glass of sin between you and me. I want to know you. Would you forgive me? Would you be my Lord? If you do that, the Bible says that that glass is removed. There's no separation of sin between you and God. God in heaven comes into your life. You are forgiven of those sins, and you will spend in all of eternity with the Lord Jesus. So the third thing that I want to tell you that, that suffering reveals to us is it reveals our faith. Paul says here in, in verse 10, he says that when the Lord Jesus comes on that day to be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at all among who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. See, Paul talks about faith. He talks just what I shared a minute ago, that, that our suffering reveals our faith. It not only reveals that we're a part of God's kingdom, but it reveals that, that we have a faith that's in the Lord Jesus. See, suffering removes all the other foundational things that we might lean against, and it shines a light on really the bedrock thing that we trust and we hope in, and that is faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the faith that, that he died on the cross for us and that we surrender to that, that that's the only thing that we have a hope in. As we've watched the last number of months with COVID-19 and watching scientists and, and doctors and, and epidemiologists and politicians and everyone trying to figure out the best way to manage and, and even economists, how do we handle the economy and financially, all of the difficulty that he's in. And they don't know. They, 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 they've got some ideas and they've got some knowledge, but not everything. And what, what this faith is, this belief is, it's us saying, you know what, there's a lot of things out there. But it's us going all in on the fact that Jesus died for us and he rose again. It's us saying, I'm not going to trust in my being a good person or being religious or being a particular church or denomination or any of those things. I'm going all in. And I'm surrendering my life to Jesus that he died and rose again. And that alone is the only thing that I have a hope and a trust in. You see, Paul is saying that when Jesus comes back, that our suffering will demonstrate to, to him, to the world, and even to us, it's a, a revealing of our faith that, that he's what we rely on. When the going gets tough, that our, our focus and our eyes are just clearly fixated right there. We don't give up hope. We don't give up. It reveals our faith. Fourth thing, it also reveals our resolve. Look what Paul says in verse 11. He says this, To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve, there it is, fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. Paul says, I'm praying for you guys. I know that you're in the middle of such persecution and suffering. He says, but I'm praying that God, that God would make you worthy of, of his calling, that he has called you to salvation, he's called you into relationship, said, come to me and know me and receive my forgiveness. And out of that, he sends us to, into this world with his purpose and his backing to, to minister and to serve a world around us. And that every one of us has that have received that salvation, he has a purpose and he has a plan for our life. And what Paul is saying is this suffering reveals our resolve in the middle of that. Paul says, I'm praying that God would fulfill your every resolve for good 
and every work of faith by his power. Here's the thing. We get struggling when we go through the suffering. We think, why do I have to go through this? It reveals our, it reveals our citizenship in heaven. Well, God, why should I go through this when the guys who are persecuting me get away with the stuff? It's worth it because it's revealing the justice of God. It's worth it because it reveals our faith is in our Lord Jesus, not in anything else around us, but in him. But God, if I'm going through such suffering, there's things that I could do. I can't. I physically can't do what I want to do. God, I'm not able to do what I'd like to do. And God says, I know. But I have a purpose in your suffering. And Paul says, I'm praying that God will fulfill every resolve, every desire, every commitment in your heart and soul to do good for the Lord Jesus. I'm praying that God will fulfill that in you and that God would accomplish every good work of faith. You see, there's, there's, there's so many things in this we need to understand is that, that our suffering doesn't keep us from accomplishing what God wants us to do. We go through hard times, it's okay. It doesn't slow down what God's plan is, is up to. In fact, it plays into it, and it actually somehow enhances it. And it, in our weakness, God is made strong. In our weakness, we focus and trust God, and God is able to do more with us because His strength shows and His ability. So Paul says, guys, don't be, don't be discouraged with your suffering. I'm praying that you would still accomplish as a church, as a family, as individuals, all that God is putting in your heart. That means for you and me, it doesn't matter how sick we are. God has a purpose. And whatever we're going through will not stop God using us, taking those steps of faith, taking those good works that we want to do, and God will accomplish those. The suffering, the persecution, the affliction doesn't thwart that in our life. Fifth thing and finally, that suffering reveals the glory of our Lord Jesus. That's how Paul sums it up. So that all of this is so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. As a result of your suffering, in other words. And catch the next phrase, and you and him. You see, our suffering points to the glory of our God. When you and I are willing to, to live gracefully, full of grace, to live faithfully, full of faith, obediently, humbly, trusting in our God, the only way that's possible is a supernatural God in heaven and imbuing us with strength and with all that we need to live. When we do that which would be impossible because of the weaknesses and the hindrances in our life, it points to the glory of our Lord Jesus. And the crazy thing about it, and I truly don't understand this, but we are also glorified in Him. Paul points back to what we talked about last week, that we are in God. That when Jesus is glorified, because we are in Him, we are also glorified. I don't understand that, how God in heaven would share His glory with us, but He does. You see, the sufferings that you go through will ultimately not only just bring glory to the Lord Jesus, but because of that and because your identity in Him, it will bring glory to you. And all of this is only made possible by the grace of our God. As he finishes, he says, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul starts, ends this chapter with where he began it. Just like fresh bread. How do we endure that suffering? The grace of God is what helps us through to endure that persecution, to keep on accomplishing the purposes of God in our life, even when it's so, so tough to, but to be true and to walk godly before him, pointing to him and trusting him and accomplishing those things, enduring the affliction, enduring the out and out persecution at times. And it reveals our citizenship in heaven. The way we're able to stand as we walk through those times is because of God's grace in us. So River, I don't know where you have suffered in the past. I don't know where you will suffer in the future. Some are suffering now significantly because of COVID-19. That breaks my heart. For, for many, it's not as much of a, a deep suffering. Some of you are suffering some much deeper things in other areas of your life. 
But I know this, I don't care how bad it ever gets. If you will keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus, He'll give you grace to endure it. And there's a reason for it. He's not only growing you and strengthening you and helping you, but He's revealing to you what you're really made of, that you really have a faith in Him, and that you can endure and that you can live honorably before God because of all of who He is. Wherever I encourage you to think about that, to rejoice in that, to trust Him in that, to talk about that as a family. Maybe mom and dad, you need to share some difficult times you've had in the past. You know the ages of your kids, what they can handle or can't handle. Uh, we don't, I don't think we help our kids by shielding them from everything in the world around us. Neither do we need to scare them. But it would be helpful for them to hear how God's been faithful to you and how you've had to learn through some of those challenges of life. So I encourage you to take some moments to, as we wrap up this video this week to pray, to honor God, and talk about some of those things. God bless you. I pray for God's grace in you as you suffer. If I can do something, let me know. And I want to say this. You, you guys, have, so many of you have reached out personally and just texted and emailed and called and just, how are you doing, Sean? How are you doing, Pastor? And that has meant so much to me. Thank you in the middle of all of that. And it, it's just a reminder to us that we are all in this together. And, and God is it's such at work. And I'm just truly grateful for that. I'm blessed and miss you guys terribly. I can't wait till we can get together again. But till then, I pray God's blessing on you.